Okay, I guess we're ready to start. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Odin. I'm a nerd. And I'm going to talk to you today about ice cream. Um, there's this concept of ice cream mix-ins that goes back a long time, where you have like a base flavor of ice cream, and then you can put like sprinkles or chocolate chips or cookie dough or whatever in it, and then they mix it up. And it's essentially, you can have many, 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 many different kinds of ice cream with a few sort of basic composable ice cream types. And um, since nerds are not really good at coming up with technical terms for things, somebody before I was born, stole this naming convention and applied it to software, where you have a bunch of functional components which you can compose together to make an object. It's, it's, a, it's a strategy of, of you know, customization points. Right? And many languages have this intrinsically, for example, D or a common lisp or whatever. Um, C++ doesn't really have mix-ins. I didn't actually set out to develop mixins. Uh, now that I have you all here and you're my captive audience, I'm going to stop talking about ice cream and start talking about microcontrollers. <laughs> I was Bryce. Ice cream. Um, this is a question. So you mixin means these things put yeah. together to make objects. Is each one of those components itself a complete thing? Or no. Or are they only complete when they come from no. the package? No. Uh, are they we will. Oh, yes. The, the question is uh, whether uh, each of the mixins uh, itself can be a complete object. Uh, they can be. They are usually not. They usually require functionality from other mixins. But we will get to that in the uh, duration of the talk. Um, yeah, if, if you don't know me or what domain I work in, I, I actually work on microcontrollers, which is not typically a C domain. Um, and, you know, microcontroller is basically a processor with a bunch of uh, peripherals, drivers, whatnot, usually contains RAM, contains uh, flash memory, and so on and so forth. Uh, they're in everything. There is you know, something like 20, 30 microcontrollers exist per person on Earth. So you definitely have a lot of them around. Um, they're in your toothbrush or your car or whatever. And the problem is there's thousands of kinds of microcontrollers. Right? So if we want to write code for drivers, if we want to write cross-platform things, what does cross-platform mean if you have tens of thousands of platforms? Right? So uh, this has kind of followed me my whole career. How do you write bare metal drivers properly? Right? And this started with naive me thinking, I'm going to be really efficient, and I'm going to write things in assembler. And it turns out that only works if you have infinite discipline. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely don't. So I shot myself in the foot a million times, and it's unteachable, and it's unscalable, and so on and so forth. Then you'd have to write you know, <coughs> tens of thousands of these if you wanted to cover all microcontrollers. So that's not the right way to do it. Most people in the industry use C with macros. Because C is essentially just portable assembler, if you will, but only portable with regard to the core. With regard to other things, if you have you know, different properties of your drivers, you still have to write a C uh, um, adaptation for each one of them. And so C tries to be generic using macros, but that doesn't really work so well. C is not a generic language. So this is maybe more contentious, but I think the whole industry is doing this wrong. Um, you can also write them by hand in C++, but you run into the exact same problems if you're not using templates and template metaprogramming, it's somewhat hard to be generic in C++. Uh, you know, typically, you don't want to use virtual functions on a microcontroller because they're not very efficient. Um, and at that point, you can't really be generic. So that doesn't work very well either. You could theoretically write a bunch of composable pieces and write all the glue code to aggregate them together to make different drivers. But the glue code ends up being about the same amount of code as if you had just written the whole thing by hand to begin with. So this doesn't really work. Then you could use uh, inheritance with virtual functions to be generic. This is, you know, Qt, for example, is a very popular library that uses this approach. And in the microcontroller space, uh, Arm, Arm's own uh, dev team are using this for their 
so-called embed platform. And this, in my opinion, is also not a good solution, although their marketing is very good at marketing it. Uh, you have problems like, I don't know, I write a Blinky application that just turns an LED on and off, and it uses half of my flash. Right? It, you, you, know, you, you could write this program in something like 300 bytes of memory, and it uses 50 kilobytes. Right? Because the optimizer can't see through all of these virtual function calls, and so it can't optimize away all the stuff that you're not using. Also, as far as speed goes, uh, there was a um, recent study by some kids from the University of Utrecht in uh, the Netherlands who compared toggling an I.O. pin in different libraries was one of the things that they compared. And embed is something like 300x slower than you could do in an assembler, and also non-deterministic, which is another problem. Um, Last one on the list is the one that, that's taken up enough of, you know, the most of my time, uh, inheritance plus curiously recurring template pattern. And this audience probably knows what CRTP stands for. <laughs> uh, people on YouTube, um, it's a trick using templates with which you can make a base class call functions in the derived class. Uh, and this is, you know, popular in, in uh, Alex Andrescu's policy-based class design. And this is what I thought was the solution for this problem for years. I spent, you know, over the course of two years, probably half a year of my life, cumulatively writing drivers using policy-based class design. And they do work. They are very efficient. But they are unteachable and unmaintainable. And it's just a giant pile of template spaghetti, right? So now, in this talk, I'm going to show you the solution. The solution is going to be awesome, right? <laughs> And uh, that's a little ironic because you know, I, there, there are other things that over the course of my career I've thought were the solution and didn't turn out to be. So grain of salt, but uh, we're going to look into how to make the glue code between different components of functionality, uh, how to extract that generically so that template metaprogramming actually writes the glue code for you. You just have to compose things. right? We're also going to look at a lot of gory implementation details, which is probably going to go pretty well with this audience. So let's look at sort of the basic strategy, right? We, you know, we, we want a mix and composition. Uh, in contrast to policy-based class design, we have two kinds of mix-ins. We have interface mix-ins. Uh, we have implementation mix-ins. The interface mix-ins add to the public interface of the composed object. The implementation mix-ins are a private, private implementation detail. Right? So we look at this in code. I have some compose factory function. I can pass it you know, the types of the interface mix-ins that I want, in this case, bells and whistles. Uh, I pass them to some value, uh, uh, sorry, variable template, so they can't hold state. And then I can pass it an arbitrary number of implementation mix-ins. These can have state. And I can initially, uh, oops, sorry, getting ahead of my slides. I can initialize them um, with state, which is also an advantage uh, over policy-based class design where initialization is not particularly trivial. I'm passing the implementation mix-ins in through the factory so I can pre-initialize them however I want. The finished object will just have you know, whatever public interface uh, functions I uh, passed in an interface as its public interface, I can just call them. I can also add more uh, implementation mix-ins. And in contrast to, say, uh, standard library containers, which have essentially a strategy pattern for an allocator, which is defaulted to the default allocator, but you can have you know, one of uh, any, any allocator that you want and, and swap out the strategy. In this case, we can just add an allocator to any composition and any other uh, private mixin that has some alternative thing that it does when it sees an allocator will just switch to that alternative functionality. Right? Some mixins can require an allocator, in which case you get a compilation error if you didn't add an allocator. But there's nothing stopping you from adding multiple allocators with fallbacks and whatnot. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's a generic. Uh, uh, Generic functionality. So 
let's, let's look at some terms before we go too much deeper into the uh, implementation details. Composition is an object containing a valid set of mixins. Valid set means every mixin that has something that it requires, there's some other mixin that provides that functionality. Right? So the whole thing is the composition. Right? The compose function returns a composition. Then we have interface and implementation mixins. Interface mixins add to the public interface, shouldn't contain state. An, uh, an interface mixin, the requirement on an interface mixin is it takes one template parameter and derives from it publicly. User doesn't have to understand why, just do that, right? And I got this idea from Gasper's uh, Liberace library. Um, semantics of uh, the um, interface mixin is anything that's in its public interface gets added to the public interface of the composed uh, of the composition. Right? Then we have the you know the guts, the the internal implementation details, and the semantic or sorry the syntactic requirements on an implementation detail are nothing. Anything can be an implementation. Bryce, yes. Uh, you said everything in the public interface. What about like special member functions? Uh, what about special member functions in the public interface? You mean like constructors? Yeah. Well, you can't really do that. Uh, um, we will get to that as well. But uh, yes, that, that is uh, um, uh, special member functions, operators, that kind of thing are a little harder in this model. But we're going to look at the implementation, and that will become clear. Um, so how do the mixins talk to each other? How, do, how does the public interface find the right mixin to talk to that it requires? Right? It would be. It would be silly to make the public interface know the type of the mixin implementation mixin it wants to call, or one implementation mixin need to know the type of the allocator it wants to call, because then you wouldn't be generic anymore, right? So the way these things find each other, right? The way the public interface finds the guts, the way some of the guts find the allocator, and so on and so forth, is by uh, a functionality I call ab abilities. Right? An ability is not quite a concept. Right? A concept is some syntactic requirement on the interface. Uh, an ability is syntactic requirement plus some semantic thing that's also associated. Right? So if I have a function f, it may uh, fulfill the interface requirements of f, the syntactic ones, fulfill the concept. But uh, I need that f to do some certain thing before it has that ability. Right? So if you're familiar with concept maps, it's a little more similar to that. So abilities are just tags, as everything in metaprogramming is. <laughs> it's just a type. And if we want to, from the public interface, uh, call a function on every mixin that has that ability, we call this free function for each. Pass it our this fun, uh, pointer so it knows what, what private arena of mixins to look in. And we pass it the ability that, that uh, we're looking for, and a polymorphic <coughs> lambda. right? And the semantics of this is the, the template metamonster is going to call this uh, polymorphic lambda for every mixin that has this ability and pass a reference to the mixin in. Right? So how do we uh, associate abilities with an implementation mixin? Well, we basically wrap the implementation mixins type. So guts impl is actually the, the type here. I guess I can just point on this stage. Guts impl is the, the, uh, the actual class type that we want to use. And then we can have a variadic pack of uh, abilities that we're associating with this uh, class type. Right? And uh, you know, the, 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 the make mixin alias is going to spit out some type that's going to just forward all the things that you construct this uh, uh, guts type with into the guts impl. Right? So it's just attempting to transparently wrap it. Right? And the last thing on our list are requirements. Right? I have some abilities. I also require abilities from some other classes. Right? You know, maybe I'm a, a, a vector control block. I require there either be a fixed buffer or an allocator. Otherwise, what's the point, right? And 
in the interest of typing the least amount and not repeating yourself, uh, we don't specify requirements explicitly. The requirements are just inherently specified by the fact that you, within functions, call other functions, right? So, so this for each, this is not requiring anything because the semantics of for each are there is zero to n of them, right? I could also say execute which I hope I had a slide for. Yes, I could also say execute, which means there has to be exactly one of these. If there's two, compile a compilation error. If there's zero, compilation error. If there's one, it works, right? And we could come up with names and bike shed about them for all the other, you know, one to n or two or whatever. Um, you can also make your own custom filter requirement, right? Maybe I need exactly 15, but none of them have, can have this other ability too, right? Uh, you can write an arbitrary uh, meta closure, which is basically a meta function that can capture uh, fixed parameters. Come to, mo to tomorrow's talk if you want to know more about what these things are. You can just specify one of these, and it will filter out exactly what you want, and static assert if that's not met, and so on and so forth. Right. So we have this. Uh, mix in composition as a theoretical construct, what does this actually look like in code? Right? How do we implement this? Right? So the return of this compose function is a type called composition, takes all the parameter, uh, all the types that you pass to compose as template arguments, and then it derives from some function call. Right? Uh, Basically, the, you know, the, 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 uh, what this template uh, meta function is doing is it's taking some magical type called access and some magical type called protect. And the protect function is quite trivial. It just takes one template argument and derives protectedly from it. Right? And this is going to be interesting for encapsulation and access rights later. So we're passing an access with the type of the, you know, the top level composition to protect. Protect is deriving from it uh, protectedly. And then we're taking that type, and we're passing that type to the first interface mixin. Remember, the interface mixins derive publicly from whatever was passed to them. So uh, the interface mixin is deriving from the other two. We pass that to the next interface mixin. It's essentially you know, a compile time fold over all the interface mixins, and at some point, when we're through all the interface mixins, composition derives from that, right? So we have a chain of base classes. These, you know, besides the special member functions like operators and constructors, but all the other member functions uh, get uh, um, pushed through to the public interface. Now this is not quite perfect because if you know, say interface one and interface three both have the same name of member function. Maybe one of them is a template. One will overshadow the other. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's uh, as good as we can do. Um, now, the interface functions are going to have to access the implementation mixins, which are in this tuple called data. Right? So how do they do that? Well, access has the type of the composition. It is a base class of that. Right? So we are allowed to take our this pointer of access and cast it to the top level type. Right? You can cast a pointer to base to a pointer uh, to derived if you know for sure that that base is a uh, base class of that derived thing. Um, so any, any member function, uh, sorry, uh, getting ahead of myself. Uh, for, for, the, for the base class to be able to access the private members of the derived class, it has to be a friend, right? Um, so the question is, did we break encapsulation here? Um, remember, for each is a free function. We're passing it our pointer from the interface class. I can always take a pointer of composition and cast it down to an interface class from the outside. And could potentially call a free function with this. Why isn't this breaking encapsulation? Well, the way for each is implemented is that the pointer type is constrained to an access T. So 
only if at the call site you can convert the type of that pointer through the protected base, then you can actually call this function. Right? So from the outside you can't, but from the inside you can't. Right? But what about this kind of access? Right? Guts and my allocator are two members of a tuple. They don't know anything about each other. Right? But they do need to access each other, potentially. Or guts needs to be able to access anything that has the ability allocator. Right? Well, every time that it would need to access this, every time that you're mutating state at all, it's going to come through the public interface. Right? Somebody called something, and that's going to cause you know, some subroutine to run and mutate state. Right? So in the public interface, right, in this public interface bells, I can call this other free function access to which basically just takes any pointer and casts it to the access, or constrains itself so that that pointer conversion has to happen at the call site. So if at the call site you're allowed to cast to a protected base, then you just get that pointer back cast, and then you can pass that around. So if we were to pass that out of the public interface, that would definitely break encapsulation. But at least conceptually, all of the implementation mix-ins are within this large encapsulation. So we can take that pointer to ourselves, essentially, and pass it to them. And then they can call for each or the other uh, you know, public functions on this pointer as if it was there, this pointer. Right? So it's the same semantics, whether it's from an interface class or from a mixing class. Right? So Whenever we're doing something to guts, we pass guts a pointer to uh, you know, the access pointer. And it can then keep going, calling you know, uh, execute or optional on my allocator. You know, optional uh, is like for each, but takes two lambdas, one of which is called in the case that the thing exists with a reference to the uh, mixin. And if it doesn't exist, then you call the second lambda, which doesn't take a parameter. So you know, if we were a, uh, a vector, maybe we can support both, or sorry, either a uh, fixed buffer or an allocator. And so you'd say optional buffer. And then the fallback would be execute allocator, because if we don't have a buffer, we will need an allocator. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure what the term hoist means in this context, to be honest. Uh, sorry, I, I'll repeat the question. Uh, um, I, I, you know, but do you need to ho hoist guts out of the, the, the context? Why are you doing this? Why am I doing this? Well, uh, if guts requires an allocator, remember guts and allocator are both just classes uh, that are members of this tuple called data, right? So they don't know that any other mixins exist, right? If if guts wanted to interact with al uh, with the allocator, uh, it doesn't have a pointer to it. It doesn't know its type. It doesn't know anything about it, right? But the public interface does. So whatever made guts need to access the allocator, it must have been a function call into guts, right? Um, it doesn't spontaneously mutate state or something. So uh, from the public interface. We pass in our you know, access token, as it were, which is basically just a pointer to the derived class, a pointer to the composition with a bunch of metadata information in it. And then guts can use that to call other mixins, you know, member functions of other mixins. And they can, you know, it could pass that on to the other mixin. The other mixin could, you know, you could keep ping ponging around between the mixins as long as it's uh, useful. So getting back to Bryce's question, what about initialization? What about uh, interactions between mixins on construction? Because guts may want to allocate something when it's initialized before the user did anything, right? I mean, if this is uh... oh, sorry, there's a, a Vittorio, yeah. another question. A mixin, uh, I think a key part. If it's guts itself that in implementation wants to 
fine, the particular mixture. Yeah. Right? How does it get the pointer from the from the composition class to know the structure? Yes. Uh, how does guts get this pointer from the composition class? Let's go back a couple of slides. Yes, we capture it in the lambda, right? Okay. Access to this converts this to uh, our well, access base what class. Access two is just a free function, okay. but it is constrained such that access two accepts uh, a pointer to access t, which is a base class of this. So this conversion is happening at the call uh, at the call site. Uh, yes, Gasper. I think the answer is the mixin is m. Mm -hmm. You pass a to ring. That's how. Okay. Yes. You get it as a oh yeah, sorry. The, yeah. The bells is the interface bit that knows its own bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Gasper clarified in better words: the mixin is m, and a gets passed to the mixin. Right. So upon initialization, I mean this is this is a problem in policy-based class design. You know, how do things interact with each other upon initialization? Um, in this scenario, uh, all of the um, implementation mixins have been initialized and passed into the tuple. The tuple has been initialized before the constructor body runs. So once we're in the constructor body, everything has been default initialized or initialized with some state once. And so we can then call anything that has the ability requires an it and destruct, and it can do its initialization. So essentially, it's two-phase initialization, which is not optimal. It would be nicer if we could do this another way. Uh, it would also be theoretically possible to initialize them in order, giving each initialization of the, uh, the uh, implementation mixin access to all the already initialized mixins. I mean, this would be possible from a uh, implementation standpoint, it would also be quite slow to compile and a terrible template monster. Um, I think I'd like to actually see a use case that you can't do with two-phase initialization before I actually implement that. Um, it's not as misbehaved as classic two-phase initialization, because the main problem, at least in my experience, of classic two-phase initialization is that you have the, uh, the ability to access a non-initialized object. right? Uh, in this case, the two-phase initialization is happening completely within uh, the implementation details of this composition. right? So the user can't just go and access a uh, partially initialized uh, implementation mixin. They can't access them directly anyway. Right? So it should be somewhat more behaved. So what about you know, a, a real world example? You know, not, a, not a toy with guts and bells and whistles and whatever, right? Uh, can we implement a fixed vector? And fixed vector was a proposal discussed in the SG14 working group. Semantics of fixed vector are essentially a hybrid between standard array and standard vector. Standard array, you have fixed size, fixed capacity. Standard vector, you have Variable size, variable capacity. What if you want fixed capacity, variable size? Right? You want to return this from a const expert function, for example, that doesn't support allocation. Or you don't have an allocator in my world. Right? Uh, you want uh, a buffer with fixed capacity with dynamic size. Right? And this kind of broke down because there were, you know, there are many different scenarios. Maybe you want your fixed vector to be able to grow on overflow, in which case it's some small object optimization buffer rather than a fixed kind of a buffer. Maybe you don't. Maybe you want the fixed buffer to be outside of the vector object so that swapping two of these vectors doesn't invalidate iterators. Maybe you want it to be inside because it's got a much more sexy interface at that point. But then swapping them would invalidate iterators because they're actually copying data around. Right? <coughs> but looking at this from a, you know, a mix-in perspective, you know, can, can, we, can we create a bunch of composable types with which you can just build your own vector however you want it? Right? it you know, this, is, this, this usually happens when you switch to like a real example. You find a bunch of problems. Right? Uh, OK, we have a fixed size buffer. Now, this fixed size buffer, 
this needs to know the alignment of the type that's going to be allocated in this fixed size buffer, which is in a different mixin. And it doesn't need to know this at time of, you know, runtime or at time of initialization. It needs to know this as part of its type, right? Because lay, you know, data layout has to go into the type, right? So we have you know, data footprint, or generally the type of a mixin has to be able to depend on the type of other mixins in the composition, right? So it's actually not just that, right? We need it in both ways. Because if we're thinking about a continuous control block, which is you know, basically what I called the control block of a vector, right? Typically, they have three pointers. They have a pointer to begin, pointer to size, pointer to capacity. Yes, tutorial. Um, for a fix, sorry, the question is, uh, you don't see a lot of, uh, Vittorio doesn't see a lot of uh, uh, um, different uh, uh, implementation possibilities for a fixed vector. Why should this be a, uh, a, an example for a uh, composition, right? Well, you know, we, we have, uh, we have growing, non-growing, right? We have internal, external buffer, which has, you know, iterator validity, uh, um, uh, implications. We also have different public interfaces, right? Notice there's no at in this public interface, right? At can throw an exception. If I'm on bare metal, I can't turn on exceptions, right? At least current exceptions. Uh, um, so maybe I don't want that in the public interface, right? Maybe I. Uh, Maybe I don't want a begin and end kind of interface. Maybe I want to work with some range class, right? I mean, if you look at, I don't know, ThinkCell's code base, they do everything in the Arno script D ThinkCell ranges. Maybe I just want to have a Arno ThinkCell y kind of range based interface, right? Uh, once you go down that rabbit hole, there are many, 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 many different ways of making a generic data container, right? And also, if you think about fixed buffer, why can't I just put that in a, I don't know, for the sake of argument, standard function? So I can make the small object optimization of a standard function be bigger, right? Why, why does that have to know anything about a vector, right? It, it will look at uh, other mixins that have a require, an alignment requirement, and its alignment will just be max of those, right? Uh, contiguous for code control block, I could probably also reuse for ring buffers or something, right? Uh, Ring buffer public interface, you know, push front, prop back is all that it supports, kind of a thing. Um, yeah, there there are essentially infinite uh, possibilities here if we can make it work, right? We're still trying to make it work. <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, um, so the contiguous control block, uh, in the case that you have a fixed buffer which is internal, you know where begin is, you know where capacity is. Why do you need to store those pointers, right? And you could even go so far in a microcontroller example to say, OK, my fixed size buffer, I know how big it is. It's smaller than I would need to allocate 256 objects. Why don't I just store an index to size and make it a uint 8, right? Uh, I mean, for a concrete example, maybe you're abstracting CAN bus data frames. Right? CAN bus data frame has a payload of either uh, of, of zero to eight bytes. Can never be more than eight bytes. Can be less than eight bytes. Right? In current C++, you'd probably use a vector, right? Because you can't use an array; it's dynamic sized. Use a vector. Well, you probably only also don't have an allocator if you're on a microcontroller, so you have some pool. So you probably need a custom allocator which has a pointer to that pool. So essentially, you have you know, begin, end, capacity, allocator pointers. It's four pointers, 16 bytes of data as a control block for eight bytes of data, right? So in that case, it would be nice if we could uh, have an internal fixed size buffer and only store an 8-bit index to the size, or, you know, one past the size, right? 
and then offer the same public interface as everybody else, right? If you want begin, well, we'll just give you a pointer to, I mean, it'd probably end up being the this pointer because that's the only thing that's got data in this, right? Uh, so can we make these things mutate sort of their type upon composition? Well, we can add a new uh, alias. Remember, we had make mixin as an alias. We can add a make dynamic mixin to which you do not pass a concrete type. You pass, again, a meta closure, which is a factory where you give it the types of all the other things in this composition, and it will spit out the type that uh, you know, this particular implementation mixin will have in that context. Right? And we can actually make this somewhat generic. We make the make mixin, you know, the non-dynamic mixin, also have a factory. Uh, you know, have a have a you know compile time metaprogram callable interface which just returns the same type, right? So uh, if you're fixed, you just return your same type. If you're dynamic, you run some factory that decides which type is the right one. And then in the composition, you don't store a tuple t's of data. You store a tuple. I call some. I call every t's with the all the other t's. This is a really cool pack expansion that I had to try out before I knew that it was actually going to work. But it does work. <laughs> um, now, this, this, this call is coming from my template metaprogramming library. It basically just uh, you know, calls the, the uh, um, uh, meta function interface of each of these t's. And so they can mutate based on other things. Right? So I can go through and filter and say, OK, all of the uh, all of the composition mixins have some, you know, public interface. Here's what I require as far as uh, al uh, alignment. I can just take the max of those. That's the alignment of my allocator. In the control block example, I can say, do I have a fixed uh, buffer? If I do, how big is it compared to my size of object? How big is the index storage thingy? Uh, that stores the, the pointer to, or the, the index of, of size, right? Now another issue, so, so we can solve that issue. Another issue we have is the size of debug builds, right? And uh, further on through without this talk, we're going to see this becoming a much bigger problem, but we can already picture, you know, there's a bunch of functions here, you know, template functions with little or no body, they just call some other function, will be inlined easy, easily by the optimizer. But in debug mode, that's just going to bloat things till debugging is not fun and your binaries become huge and whatever. And we have this specific problem on microcontrollers that the debug build probably should fit on the microcontroller, right? <laughs> and the debug build probably should at least somewhat fulfill the hard real-time requirements that the release build does. And so this just completely breaks down. Um, we have this problem with pretty much any template metaprogrammy code. Mm -hmm. So what you end up doing is compiling and release with debug symbols, and then do not optimize whatever you actually want to debug. And I would like a tool to kind of automatically do that on a namespace basis. But uh, yeah, that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk. Again, coming back to the iterator validity contracts and other contracts, right? If you have contracts surrounding your object, when are they fulfilled and when are they not fulfilled? Well, that's going to depend on what composition of mixins are in there, right? And this will get somewhat easier with concepts, I think. I mean, you could make like const expert member functions that say, do you invalidate iterators on swap or not? And then make a concept that checks that. And so the user can then check that their, their view of what's going to happen with iterators uh, matches whatever this container guarantees about iterators. Uh, it's probably not that fun to implement. <laughs> um, I, I think this is still an open question. I think it is solvable. I haven't solved it yet in any sort of proof of concept way. Uh, but yeah, I think we generally have this uh, problem when it comes to composable component stuff general, right? Testing things, again, is very hard if you have infinite compositional capabilities, right? And we, we already have this problem with, you know, uh, 
algorithms and data structures in the standard library, there's a lot of compositional possibilities there. And what we do is we say, OK, these, these fulfill this sort of generic interface. And then if both sides fulfill that generic interface, then everything works. Uh, it's kind of hard to unit test that something fulfills some generic interface perfectly. So especially if you have a lot of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to simplify this. This is, this is kind of a problem. Um, coming back to Bryce's original question, constructors are definitely hard. I mean, if you wanted your fixed vector to have the same constructor interface as a um, normal vector, then how do you do that? Right? You have some parameters that are passed in which need to go to some implementation mix-ins in some way. How do you describe that? And I attempted to solve this problem by volunteering, without any of his knowledge, Gasper to do a talk on how to do this. He didn't submit that talk. So apparently, I have failed in my passing this off to somebody else that's smarter than me. Um, I do think it's possible to, yes? Next year. Next year. OK, you hear it. He's probably, he's going to, yeah, anyway. Um, I think this is somewhat solvable with, uh, you know, what, what, what he, Gasper calls production guidelines, which I think Sean Parent touched on at some point. I'm not sure if he called it something else. I mean, it's, yeah, production guidelines, but compile time. Yes. So, so basically, very around time. yes. Uh, so, I, you know, a compile time way of explaining uh, how things, you know, how, how you can convert your set of, inner, uh, of parameters supplied by the user to some set which you can consume, right? Uh, this would probably help some other containers in the standard library that have like 20 constructors or something. Because if you look at uh, you know, the brute force approach of instantiating out every uh, valid uh, permutation of allocators and data and ranges and whatever, uh, you could write code that would just say which ones are valid and you know what the what the priority precedence is of that right if there's if there's something that's the last parameter of something and it fulfills the allocator interface it's probably an allocator right uh, that kind of thing um, so yeah I think this is probably solvable but uh, I'm not sure if I'm smart enough and I definitely haven't had time yet <laughs> yes question yes This end up having to do some recursive graph of everything. Yeah. Recursive stuff is just being recorded. Uh, yes. Um, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, this is a problem. Um, and I'm actually lying to all of you. My implementation doesn't use a tuple. It uses something similar to a tuple that uh, gets around this problem. Um, I, how? How? Uh, it just uh, does not, well, it, 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 it derives from a variadic pack of uh, base classes. And you know, tuple implementations, depending on the library, will have this, you know, either they will be recursive, right? in which case you can do empty base optimization. If you derive from the empty thing, that requires that the empty thing is not final, which some things are. <laughs> Uh, which means you have to test them in traits, whether it's final or not, and you know, use it as a data member, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Um, basically, what I'm doing is, if it's empty, I'm not even putting it in a base class. I'm just constructing one whenever you need one. So it needs to be default to constructible or trivially default to constructible. I actually learned that yesterday from, uh, so that's a bug in my implementation. I learned that from Marshall yesterday, but yes, Bryce. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, yes. Another question. So, if this becomes horribly low effect, um, have you simply considered using the Chris processor and put the least in code in one or two files that you uh, include where you need them? I. And the code would be 
It's probably much easier to do that with Trace. Um, uh, the, 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 sorry, the question was uh, whether I've considered using the preprocessor to do uh, some of the uh, generic programming component of this. I hope that's a good rephrasing of your question. Um, well, I have done some preprocessor metaprogramming. Uh, I think this is something that's not finitely measurable or even because it's, it's a matter of taste. I don't consider it easier to debug. <laughs> um, you yes. Me wrong. I'm not talking about uh, using macros. Yeah. I'm talking about using include files. Uh, so not using Mac, using include files. Yeah, for example, you would have a uh, traversable uh, dot, uh, I don't know, you invent an extension in which you, you have begin and end and the count version of them. And when you leave them in a class, you simply say include inside, inside curly braces, right? Uh, OK. And I, when uh, you trace that code in a debugger, you will see the code exactly as it is. Um, Yes, I think I, it, it's kind of the same paradigm that, uh, um, I'm not going to be able to repeat that question, sorry, but it's kind of the same paradigm that Boost Preprocessor uses in its implementation, right, of, you know, including things uh, conditionally, it's just you'd be doing that top level, yeah, if I understand it, that correctly. In the past it was called, I think, external macros. External macros. Which um, macros, they're just, you know, they're just giving a set of strings. Yeah. I'm not particularly familiar with that kind of flavor of voodoo, but uh, <laughs> how about uh, I continue on with other, all the other sort of reflection stuff that, that this implementation allows, and then we can have a conversation at the end if it's still a viable. Uh, yes, uh, I think you were first. I think the idea was not about including files in the beginning of the source, but yes. inside of the loop, for example. Yes. Yes, the, the question, uh, to repeat that question, the question was not about uh, uh, including files top level at the beginning of the header, including them in the loop, which is, Inside of the lambda. yes, yes, which is, uh, I believe, the way Boost Preprocessor implements a lot of its macro voodoo. Um, yes? The gas for Uh, yes, Gasper's comment was you can't initialize with state in that paradigm, which I'm not sure I'm understanding the paradigm well enough to. We'll talk later about that. Anyway, so uh, moving on. Um, uh, sorry, a question at the back. So regarding the problem of constructors, in C17, there was a, the pack expansion and user declaration. Was yeah. Pack expansion. Oh, uh, yeah. I think, I think, if you were to implement this library in C plus plus seventeen, you could do several things differently. Compose, for example, could be a uh, you know type deducing constructor, whatever it's called officially. Uh, you wouldn't need the factory function anymore, and you could do some other voodoo. Yeah, uh, Bryce. Yeah, I, I had the same thought. Uh, So Bryce's comment is that uh, variadic using is a very interesting and powerful uh, function, and I should look into it. Yeah. I should look into it. <laughs> Vittorio. So I guess the problem is that you wanted to provide constructors which make sense for various combinations that make sense, right? Yeah. Yes. How about you create a new class, which is fix factor, which derives from fix factor info, which is using the make sense, yeah. and then you manually provide constructors which skin out depending on the make sense that are in the base class. Uh, yes, with yeah. yes. Uh, Vittorio's comment is you could make essentially a, a, a wrapper around the composition, which, uh, uh, derive, which uh, uh, the composition derives from, or sorry, derives from the, it, anyway, the right way around of that, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, provides the uh, public constructors. Um, yes, uh, I mean, I think what may be the solution here is having the uh, composition class have just a templated, you know, variadic template, you give me stuff constructor, and then we extract rules from all the mixins of what is valid, when we need to sphene. We are getting, I think in C++, uh, 
20 conditional no accept, I hope, because otherwise you'd have to have, uh, not no, like, sorry, not conditional, uh, conditional explicit. That's what I'm looking for, because otherwise you'd need two, one of them explicit, one of them non-explicit, swiney for the right one. It's, it's a huge can of worms. Um, yeah, I, I, talk to me after the talk if you think there's another way of implementing this, which is interesting. Uh, um, so coming back to another example in my domain, uh, this is you know, an industrial control system. And it has a big red button, as most industrial control systems have. And the idea is that you push the big red button when something's going wrong. right? And whether or not something's going wrong may have to do with these lights over here, may have to do with what's on that screen. right? So big red button is pushed with high latency because there's a human involved. Uh, whenever something on that screen or in the form of those lights looks wrong. Uh, that means that if you're, you know, from a security validation standpoint, that you need to prove that changes in the system will be reflected on that GUI within some fixed amount of time, right? Because if it takes a day before sensor change actually causes GUI change, then that big red button is probably not going to be pushed in time. So this sounds silly, because obviously we can write a system that will just change the GUI within very quickly, right? But can you formally prove that? <laughs> I mean, can you guarantee that? Um, for a talk long, long ago uh, for a user group, I was talking about the effects of caching and did an experiment where I allocated many, 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 many very small objects into a large vector, and then deallocated them in the same order that I had allocated them. That went quickly. Then I shuffled the vector, and then deallocated them in the order that they were in, right? So having been shuffled, that went slower because of cache misses. And then just for shits and giggles, I divided that vector into six pieces, because I was on a, I think the, 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 the first, uh, um, uh, core i7 had six real cores, and deleted them in parallel just to see what would happen. Right? And this means that the, everybody's fighting over the heap lock. Right? There's also false sharing because these objects are smaller than a cache line. And uh, you know, what had taken 100 milliseconds shuffled took 14 hours. And to be fair, I've done this more recently. Somebody fixed the heap implementation. So now it only takes 20 minutes. But still, there's a big difference between 100 milliseconds and 20 minutes. right? And this, you know, this is a very Machiavellian example. But somebody deleting many linked lists that uh, may be sharing cache lines on many threads in parallel, maybe some kill signal was sent or something, this could actually happen. right? And so we need to be able to prove that things like this are not going to happen. Otherwise, we can't prove that, I mean, in practice, somebody's going to be sleeping and not push that big red button. But you know, security validation people, they, they don't want to hear that. right? So, so we can't just put a pi zero in here and fire up some you know, QT GUI. right? We need to actually make a GUI that's deterministic. And these things take, ah. Uh, embarrassingly large amount of man hours, right? And you know, if you look at something from Siemens or you know, some other industrial automation company, they have their own GUIs. And they look like crap. And they cost way more than they need to. So can we make a deterministic GUI with this mixing composition thing, right? Well, this is, this is QT. And I'm not saying cute even though they want to be called cute, because to me, this is not cute. Because small things are cute. Like a little fluffy bunny, that's cute, right? But if your little fluffy bunny uses a virtual function, so it's actually the size of Manhattan, that's not cute anymore. That's way too big to be cute, OK? <laughs> so uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the, you know, the cute widget system, which is one way that's pretty popular that we build GUIs, uh, you have you know, what's called a widget, which is one of these small elements. You know, this will be a label widget. This will be a text box widget, right? And these widgets are essentially leaves in a composed tree, 
of widgets. And all the branches in this tree are, are layouts, right? So you have one vertical box layout with a pane, you know, widget down at the bottom, widget up at the top, widget down at the bottom. Again, is a horizontal box layout consisting of a stretch, which just takes up all the empty space, and an OK button widget and a cancel button widget, right? And the top one is probably a grid layout consisting of four different panes. And if we look at the top right pane, it's probably, again, a horizontal box layout and so on and so forth, right? So it's a composed tree of widgets. At the leaves of these, uh, this, this tree are the actual widgets, right? Um, so how much of this is known at compile time? All of it, except for maybe the text in the text fields. But you know, all of the layout, all the widgets, all that stuff is known at compile time. So why are we using virtual functions, <laughs> right? Why are we allocating on the heap all of these elements? Because if you're allocating all these elements on the heap, especially if you're in a multi-threaded program, the locality of these objects relative to each other on the heap will depend on heap fragmentation and order of uh, uh, So whether or not you have a cache miss at you know, when calling some function will depend on, will not be uh, deterministic, right? It will, it will be different over two different runs, right? Because they may be allocated in two different places when you reboot it, right? Because allocation went in a different order because time plays a role in that, right? So can we build this using mixins? I mean, the kind of public interface that we want is something like this. Where here at the top we have this virtual box layout, uh, vertical box layout, sorry, which has the two panes, the grid layout up at the top, the horizontal box layout down at the bottom. Our Bonsal box layout again has a stretch widget and two push budget wi button widgets. Can we make this interface work as makes sense? Right? Well, what is this vbox layout function that we're calling? Basically, it's a function that takes a very variadic amount of child widgets, right? And it prepends a list of abilities, a public interface, some uh, implementation mixins, and then all of the children, right? Uh, now this this uh, ability syntax here is new, right? This is the other way of associating abilities with a implementation mixin. If the first parameter of a composition is a list of abilities, then those abilities will be associated with that composition. And you can use a composition of mixins as an implementation mixin in a higher order composition of mixins, right? So you can nest them in like a tree, right? Interface, well, you know, some generic widget interface, you know, this would probably in practice be multiple interfaces so you can build them up because you have you know, some generic object will have you know, some interface and then you know, a push button will have a few more functions in its interface. But that's bike shitting at this point. Uh, so what about QT's signal slot mechanism? Right? We have, whenever I, whenever I uh, Whenever I type into this field below the size label, I want to have the selection in this list widget, or the select widget, sorry, um, switch. Right? So if I were to delete that 24 and type 8, I would want it to select the top one. Right? And the other way around is true as well. If I select 12, I want the text up at the top to change to 12. Right? And this connection, this, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, you know, publish subscriber model, which is basically what signals and slots are, uh, is also known at compile time. I mean, I, I don't know at runtime that these are connected together. I know at compile time that these are somehow semantically or functionally connected together. And in Qt, I actually connect them together at runtime. So functions have to be virtual, and I'm calling through, you know, indirect pointers and blah, 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 blah. And so the optimizer gets confused, and it turns into a Manhattan bunny, right? Um, can I do this in mixins? Right. Well, if we look at uh, you know, uh, a portion of the widget interface, 
The widget interface will be getting, you know, I'll, I'll be dispatching events to this. And the, the semantics are events propagate to all the children, propagate all their children, propagate to all their children. So if I have like a resize event or a redraw, repaint event or a, I don't know, key press event, then I'll look, is that key press event a tab? And if so, where's the cursor? Where do I change the cursor to? Blah, 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 right? This is happening through a ginormous tree of, uh, virtual calls in Qt, um, if we have a composed tree of mixins, then we can just propagate everything to our children. And most of those calls ends in leaves that don't care, right? So the optimizer can take those back away because the optimizer sees what we're doing, right? Uh, if you notice, there's essentially two identical dispatch event functions. There's a dispatch event that just takes an event, and there's a dispatch event that takes an A. <laughs> well, if this A is the access element to the root of the tree, right? Dispatch event gets the dispatch to the root. Root takes X access, passes it on to dispatch event of all of its children. They pass that on to dispatch event of all their children. This key press event comes from, uh, well, comes from the keyboard into the root of the thing. Um, we, depending on where the cursor is, dispatch it to the right uh, um, child widget, the right leaf of this tree, right? At some point, it will get consumed into this consume event function, right? Um, in this consume event uh, function, I have access to my local arena of uh, implementation mixins. I also have an access to the root. Right? I've just passed this pointer along all the way down. Yes, Jens? How do I add the widget at runtime then? How do I add a widget at runtime is Jens's question. Uh, I will get back to that in a minute. Um, so for the, for the I know everything at compile time example, uh, I have some tree of widgets. One of these widgets got a key press event, and it wants to publish some named event, some named action that happens. You know, in this case, we're, you know, a dialog box, somebody pressed a key, somebody at composition time named that action, I don't know, uh, 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 font size changed or something, right? Uh, hopefully we get nice uh, string literal syntax where we can just, a uh, user divine literal syntax which can capture the characters as a compile time pack of chars. Uh, that would help in this, but you could also use a tag type in order to uh, name this signal slot connection. Now this widget has a pointer to, to the axis of the root, and so it calls that. It propagates all the way down to this other guy who's interested. And if that triggers another uh, signal, then I can just keep doing that until everything's propagated. Has the nice uh, side effect of giving you a compile time error if you have infinite recursion in your signal slot kind of things, which is something you find out at runtime in Qt. Um, coming back to Jens's question, uh, what if you want to add a widget at runtime? Um, counter question is how often do you want to do that, right? Uh, oftentimes you have a um, one widget that is, uh, sorry, one space in your dialog that could be one widget in one mode and some other widget or maybe a layout in another mode. In which case you could make a variant of widgets, right? So you have a, a, a variant of different widgets and then you dispatch that still works with you know full uh, uh, you know using using the the type system, right? Essentially, every event that reaches that variant will be uh, will go into a switch and then get dispatched to whichever child is currently selected, right? There are examples like I don't know a toolbar where you can drag things off of that toolbar and put them in some other place or whatever, where you actually do only at runtime know what widget is going in there, right? And uh, this model won't work so well for that. Uh, at the very end of the talk, I'll get into how to maybe mitigate that. But uh, 
I don't think that ever happens in industrial control systems. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not quite the scope of QT, right? And um, you know, another limiting factor is compilation speed, right? I mean, this is a lot of metaprogramming going on. Uh, actually, um, in my initial benchmarking of this kind of thing, it turns out uh, these standard tuples were taking up most of the compile time. Uh, so that gives you a bit of an order of magnitude of how long this takes to compile. But in uh, 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 a QT dialog that has you know, 200 widgets or something, you're making 200 different nested tuples. That already takes quite a bit of compile time. Uh, yes, Jason. Uh, did you measure where in the compile time that's taking the longest? Is it in the optimization phase or actually like before? Uh, it's, it's in, it's in the, the uh, sorry, uh, did I measure whether it was taking uh, time in the optimization phase or in the, uh, um, what, front end uh, compilation, you know, where, where, where TMP runs, the, the, the awesomest phase of compilation? Uh, um, it's, 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 it's for, uh, for the TMP. Optimization actually runs incredibly well. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm actually doing something really similar, and I found a lot of the functions, because of they would have large tuples, would have huge symbols, and the optimizer would have to deal with the huge symbols, and there's a lot of I.O. going on, and it would take the majority of the time would be in the optimization phase. Uh, yes, the comment was that uh, large tuples uh, create uh, large symbols, um, which uh, slows down the optimization phase. Uh, I'm not sure I've actually measured that at all, to be honest. But I know, uh, um, what was his name? There's another crazy guy that works with giant tuples. Uh, I don't remember his name. But um, uh, yeah, he works with tuples that are like more than 1,000 elements. And uh, yeah, uh, um, I think if we, I mean, that, you know, a, a, a large, you know, a recursive tuple. Right, which is in GCC standard library implementation of tuple is recursive. You're not just creating one type of the tuple, which has a lot of parameters. You're creating one type with a lot of parameters, another type with one parameter less, another type with one parameter less, another type with one parameter less, all the way down the chain, which is going to cause a lot more symbol bloat. Right? Um, I think with the alias-based metaprogramming approach, you can cut down on symbol bloat a lot because you're just creating far, 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 far fewer types. Uh, you know, template parameters to aliases don't get minimalized and don't find their way into the signatures of functions and whatnot, right? Uh, so you can uh, optimize the way you code TMP to provide the, the smallest number of uh, um, symbols in you know, the function signature or whatnot. Uh, I don't know how much that mitigates this problem. I haven't really benchmarked, but I think it, it could potentially be pretty big. Uh, yes, Vittorio. Have you considered type erasing the whole thing? Like you have this giant tree, you type erase the tree once, and then you don't have to recompile that anymore. Three slides, or four slides. <laughs> um, so uh, coming back to drivers, um, this is step seven of a 17-step Hebel World tutorial for a microcontroller. And uh, this is not somebody just, you know, a, a, a obfuscation of hello world contest or something. This is actually the 17-part, uh, 17-step tutorial of how to write hello world for a microcontroller published by the microcontroller vendor, right? <laughs> uh, and as you can see, I mean, they are abstracting things in C, which is not lowering complexity or encapsulating anything. It's just causing code bloat, in my opinion. Um, and I've said previously that you can do this kind of thing, like this is essentially the inherent complexity. And you could do this kind of thing in C++ and have it compile down to something more, uh, op or you know, with a smaller memory footprint and faster runtime than the C. And I've been saying this for like two and a half years now. And I did implement drivers that did this uh, using policy-based class design. They just weren't maintainable or anything. They were sometimes like 10x more efficient than the, hand, you know, the, the C trying to be generic. But with, with this uh, mix-in uh, um, technology, I think I can take all of the glue code, most of the complexity, and put it in some kind of 
composition that, oh, fixed vector, damn it, sorry. It should say awesome UART driver here. UART is, is by the way, it's a serial port. It's, it's a, yeah. Uh, um, I could write this. I could write this in a way that a user could maybe add a custom buffer and no longer blocking I.O. and whatnot. As soon as they understand polymorphic lambdas and are willing to deal with a bit of variable templates in the public interface. I mean, the bar to extending this class is you know, orders of magnitude lower than it would be to, to extend my policy-based class design implementations. Well, until they get a compiler error. Yes, until they get a compiler error. Well, actually, compiler errors, if, if you do actually find something that I didn't anticipate, then yes. Like, compiler errors could be megabytes, right? Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, Clang will abbreviate them at, at some point. But if you turn that off, like, you could fill up your hard drive with compiler error. Um, the cool thing is, uh, what is your interface? Your interface is uh, these free functions like for each, right? If you screw that up, if you pass something to a for each which is not a polymorphic lambda, I can give you a relatively good compiler error. If, 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 the, if the function signature doesn't match, you get a somewhat readable compiler error. Um, what else can you screw up? Well, if you, if you have an interface mix in, and you do not derive publicly from your template parameter, well, God help you, right? Uh, I, I can't anticipate that. I can't really. I mean, I could look in Compose if I can actually reach a, uh, an access base or something and give you some kind of compiler, but it would probably blow up before you actually get to that point. So yeah, I don't know. But uh, um, I mean, the, 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 the takeaway is, uh, since everything is encapsulated pretty well, and you're not actually reaching into the guts of my TMP, I give you an interface to my TMP, then it's much harder to actually create an unreadable template error. It's still possible. So coming back to Vittorio's question, can't we type erase this? Uh, we can, using the strategy from Gasper's uh, Liberaced. Basically, it's a composable uh, concept-based polymorphic wrapper. You know, it's, it's Sean Parent's concept-based polymorphism paradigm, but built up out of composable pieces, right? So if I take every interface mix-in and add maybe a traits with which you can say, for this interface mix-in, what are the two other functions that I need, right? You know, the, the public interface function, the virtual function. I have the implementation function. Uh, that I need to make a concept-based polymorphic wrapper around this type. Right? And it does mean that you can't do any template functions anymore in the public interface, which means I cry. But uh, it is, in my opinion, a viable solution for getting around um, the fact that this composed type is unexpressible. <laughs> right? Uh, it also gets around, you know, could potentially get around the problem that Jens pointed out of adding uh, runtime switchable creatable widgets, right? I can say, okay, this pane in my GUI, this thing is some widget, right? I mean, I would have to data encode the type of uh, the events that are passed to me, which means I'd probably have to give a list of the events that this thing can consume. You know, the list of events that go, can propagate through this type erased interface, and then do something like uh, Jackie K did in, in uh, um, uh, what was the name of her library? Petra. Petra, yeah. Um, that, that would work. It would be a little messy, because the user would actually have to write out you know, a list of all the events that this thing can consume. And if, they screw up, then you figure it out at runtime because we can't do compile time checks through a typerist interface. But I think this is a you know a, a viable solution for the fact or for the situation where you really don't know at compile time what you're getting. You know, counterexample is most of the time you do know what you're getting, even if it's not one thing, right? Use a variant. Use a Unity build. I mean, 
not most of you, but if you're on a microcontroller, it's hard to make a Unity build large enough that the compiler can't handle it and still have it sit, fit in 32K of Flash, right? So Unity builds work very well in my domain. <laughs> Yeah, if I, uh, the, 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 the comment is, uh, if I add an any to my variant, um, however, that means that I can't uh, propagate template instantiation through that any barrier. I mean, it's essentially, again, a you know, compile time firewall, if you will, uh, which has the same problems as virtual functions. It's still better than uh, void pointers of Qt. Yes, <laughs> it's still better than void, void pointers of Qt, is the comment from Gasper. Uh, that's very true. That is one, OK. That is the only thing that's wrong with Qt. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> no. OK, so uh, that's my mix-ins. It's definitely uh, still a work in progress. Um, I think it has the potential to change the way we do some things. Uh, for example, uh, event filters. If you have an event pump and you want to dispatch that event to something composable, but you don't want to pay for virtual functions, and you also don't want to uh, give the guy that writes the event filter absolute job security. Uh, I think this is a, a, you know, a viable tool. Or anywhere we have some kind of component system, uh, or you're trying to make a very generic toolbox with which you can make some kind of class. Uh, yeah, I'm going to open it up for questions. I guess I have 10 minutes left. Yes, Vittorio. Uh, how this would interact with meta classes, and if you think that they wouldn't work, maybe you take this as an opportunity to get involved because it's useful and it would be nice if you have language support to do this in, in an easy way. So maybe get involved into the discussion around meta classes that's happening right now. Yeah, I'm going to very much summarize that. Uh, um, uh, you know, how does this interact with the proposed meta classes? Um, I think it is good testing ground, if you will. I mean, it provides some of the functionality that you have with meta classes. I mean, as long as that other thing is a composition, I can do some limited reflection on it, right? Which is basically what we're doing in the in the uh, uh, Qt GUI example or Qt GUI uh, uh, alternative example. Um, I basically need this to work now, and I don't know how long it's going to take till we get meta classes. Uh, so yeah, this is C++14, and the only reason it needs to be C++14 is polymorphic uh, uh, lambdas. If you want to write your own lambdas, you could make it work in C++11. So uh, yeah, I think you know, as far as gaining real-world experience for how life will be with metaclasses, this might be a little bit useful. Uh, maybe not. Uh, with meta classes, obviously, you could just compose a bunch of stuff, have some meta thing go through and reflect on all of them, and there's build you the awesomest GUI ever, and it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> Bryce. Um, so first off, I'll say I think meta classes is like a C plus plus thirty two feature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but second, I I twenty thirty two or thirty thirty two. I was uh, sort of thinking myself. Oh, ah, that, damn you. <laughs> yes. Um, I was thinking to myself as, as you were going through this talk, it, it really seems like you might want a language feature for mix-ins. Um, uh, have you ever thought about I mean, yes, you said you, you, you still need something that works now. But have, have you given any thought to this? And I, I, I seem to recall, and maybe some of you here remember this better than I do, but there have been proposals in this direction before in the committee. I don't really remember what happened to them. But uh, okay. yeah. I got the impression that there were proposals, and, and they were all bad. <laughs> um, for, for really, really you know, legitimate technical reasons, uh, constructors notwithstanding, right? That was one of the yeah. issues. And uh, when Odin showed me this last year at CppCon, I was like, I think you have the semantics for C++ mixins. You don't have the syntax, but I think you have the semantics. Yeah. And I, I think that's when she said, I, I need to do a talk about this. 
And I do think, I do think, in terms of like smaller scope, there's probably like the issue of uh, uh, special uh, being able to inherit special member functions um, uh, and compose the special member functions in a uh, more pleasant way uh, <laughs> is like a smaller, more contained problem that maybe we could. The Come on. Special member functions <laughs> in all of the like plus equals stuff. Uh, okay, let's just think about constructors. Right. Yeah, um, constructors are difficult. It's not just a syntactic problem with constructors, though, because I mean, there's there's still the semantic problem of where does it go. Yeah, you have the problem of composing initialization lists uh, where you have to interleave them, and you have to interleave them in a graph that makes sense. Uh, so, I think I have a solution for this based on the Sean Parent like flow graph with compile time. But until I write a library, we're not going to know if it works. We should do that. I. <laughs> uh, uh, you do don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, just just to answer the question. Um, I'm uh, a simple nerd with simple problems and have enough sort of imposter syndrome remnants that I haven't even thought about uh, language proposal stuff. Um, I think it might be an advantage that I just built it to solve my problem rather than any sort of theoretical uh, uh, goals. I think it's... Uh, I think it's unfortunate that most things go into the standard library anymore without a lot of real world use. Yeah. And that was, that was a role that Boost traditionally uh, filled. I mean, a lot of stuff that went into library went through Boost first. And now most people are going straight to the standards committee, which seems to me to be a little more dangerous of, you know, there's a little more danger of getting it wrong than really is uh, a good idea. So, yeah, I hope to, in library space, get some, uh, on the other hand, Experience. yes, I have young kids at home, so don't expect me to put a hell of a lot of uh, hours into this in the short term. <laughs> uh, yes? Yeah. And you're going to need to store a fixed vector in your class somewhere. Yeah. Right? So your fixed vector compose would be a single statement in some class, some static function that is yeah. this thing. And then I'd have to do a tickle type of that to store it in the class. Yes. Um, do you have a better way of doing that? Uh, yes. The, the, the question is uh, um, to summarize, I hope this is correct. Uh, the the type that is returned from my compose function is unexpressible. And how do you get around that problem? Maybe you have a class that needs to have a member variable that is of the type of this mixing, right? Um, one way to make, I mean, one way to do this, you know, the, the big hammer solution is to, you know, use decal type as you did, you know, compose decal type of that compose. You have to write it twice. Uh, the, stick, it in a, stick it in a static member function. Yeah. Well, in my model, it's a free function, so it doesn't have to be static. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, you could create an alias to which you pass the types of all the things that you put into this compose function, which would then spit out the type. That's still not perfect. I, I think that's another weakness that uh, you know of, of this, uh, which maybe we could eventually find a better solution to, but. That's okay. the best I can do at this point. All right. Um, uh, along the same line, I've used uh, Boost Proto in the past to do this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, which is, I think, what the other gentleman was talking about. They say, hey, Boost Proto, if you guys didn't know, it's, uh, for those who don't know, it's like completely pre processed stuff. Yeah. Okay. There's no metaprogramming. Um, so that provided the same kind of, of interface, except that compile times are a lot faster. Because yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as the compile times, uh, come to my other talk. 
uh, I think you can reduce uh, compile time against, well, against boost MPL, probably three orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, I did repeat the question. So the sign is being held up. Uh, yeah, they, they were the, the, the comment is that uh, boost proto does a lot of the same things, but in macro magic, which compiles faster. Um, in macro magic, I don't think you could do a lot of the reflection stuff. Uh, but um, and, and the it compiles faster argument uh, is a problem that can also be optimized. I'll put it that way. Um, I think uh, you can certainly write compositions that compile too slowly, but they're going to be huge. I think the constraining factor is uh, <laughs> symbol bloat and com compilation errors crashing your compiler and that kind of thing, and not, uh, I mean, in, in modern type-based, you know, alias-based metaprogramming, you can work on lists of 10,000 types. You can sort a list of 10,000 types, and your compile time stays under 30 seconds, right? I mean, it, it is a different beast at this point than it was in the Boost MPL days. <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, yes, back there. Uh, yes, to summarize the question, uh, people treat us meta programming addicts uh, in similar ways that you would treat like a meth addict. You would, you would send them to therapy because they're going to be very destructive to the team effort. Uh, I think there's merit to that. I think template meta programming. Uh, it does raise the bar considerably of like onboarding and uh, that kind of thing. Um, it's a problem I'm 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 working on because we really really do need it in my domain. I think. Uh, I mean, I can use this at work because I can decide at work what gets used. <laughs> uh, and my my well, the the if you look at Shed, my job description at work is Chaos Monkey which is a, a title that I didn't give my, uh, myself. Um, and yeah, it, it, it can be hard for the team. Uh, I think uh, if we treat metaprogramming the same way we treat uh, other things that can be potentially dangerous, like, I don't know, we use regex rather than you building your own uh, uh, um, uh, uh, parser or you know, things like that that are also dangerous, we try to encapsulate them. And I think the problem with metaprogramming is it's been hard to encapsulate or encapsulating it well so that the team can't screw up very easily, kills your compile time to the point where you don't do it, or uh, things like that. I mean, we have, we have at work the uh, guideline that if you, if you cause a template error, uh, that error is the template metaprogramming author's fault, not the user's fault, no matter what they did, <laughs> right? So if the user gets a plain text error, uh, that's their fault. If they get template spew, that's the library author's fault. And if you go down that route, it becomes much harder to be a library author, but it becomes much easier to be a user. And uh, again, my other talk, we're going to get into some of the ways of making TMP more readable especially to the user. Um, so yeah, come and I talk. Ultimate pitch. Jens. Now, I want to use six vector, and I include here a child and I use it in IDE or some other uh, program which usually shows me the interface yeah. of a child. Is there a way to do that? Um, the question is, if you, know, if, if you use a uh, fixed vector, will uh, IDEs show you the interface and whatnot? Um, we have some uh, JetBrains people here. Uh, I, I mean, I, IDE will show you the public interface of base classes. So yes, in that regard. Uh, um, coming back to JetBrains, they have been very good at fixing bugs in the past. And they have, they have an ultimate Trump wildcard 
named Timur Dumler, who's doing their uh, um, front end uh, processing. And I've talked to him about some of uh, the terrible, terrible things that I do and if they will work with the JetBrains front end. And I think uh, it is doable. I mean, it's, it's a quality implementation issue on the part of the IDE. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? I think we're over time by now, so. Yep. yep.